Today, we're gonna to talk about the Denon DR-M44 cassette deck and why it's worth picking up if you see one, especially if you're new to tape collecting. And I'm also gonna show you why I was really lucky to find this particular one. So stick around, because this one's pretty cool. So this is the Denon DR-M44. It's a cassette deck from 1984. We've had it for about a year or so, and for some reason, I never really got around to fully testing it. I'm not entirely sure why. I think it just got buried. But if I remember correctly, it came from an estate sale on a Sunday and we got it for free. A lot of times by Sunday afternoon, they're tired and over it and start giving away stuff for free just to get it out of the house. I believe that was the case with this deck here. Kind of wild. So what makes this deck unique? And more importantly, what makes this an appropriate upgrade for people who are new to cassette collecting? The short answer is that it's giving you some higher end features with a very low experience barrier for entry. Now, having said that, I'm gonna use the rest of this video to attempt to explain what I mean by that. Now, experienced tape heads, you guys probably already caught this earlier, but don't spoil it. Newbies, I want you to pause the video for just a second and see if you can guess what's missing from the front of this deck. Anybody catch it? It's a tape type selector. This doesn't have one at least not in the conventional sense. They've gone about that in a completely different way than I've shown you guys before, and it's the first thing that we're gonna talk about that makes this such an easy deck to use. Almost every other deck I've covered on the channel requires you to know what kind of tape you're recording onto and to make sure that what you are using is compatible with the setting options that they're giving you. And while those kinds of nuances are part of the joy of this hobby for some of us, it's also a lot more to keep track of than some people want, which is fair. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that with this machine. Inside the door are a group of little tabs which index to holes on top of your cassette cartridge. They act as a rudimentary encoding system that tells the machine exactly what type of tape you're using. It'll even show you on the display. This is, of course, not unique to this machine or to Denon as a whole. A lot of better tape players do this, but it's a convenience that I think makes it particularly appealing if you have little to no experience with tapes. Now, this deck also has auto-tuning. In a nutshell, that's meant to further refine the recording settings for your individual cassette. Denon makes the argument in the manual that there are differences between brands and individual tapes themselves, and this is able to fine-tune the recording settings to give you the best possible recording response. It does it by recording a little temporary test signal onto the tape and using that as a reference. So, besides automatically selecting the tape bias and auto-tuning, Two of the other key features to this deck are inside the tape transport. It's a dual capstan, which is a first for the channel, and it has three heads, not unlike the guardian statues of Sirith Ungol on the edge of Mordor. So I'll show you that too when we get to it. But let's take a look at the deck itself. The front is a nice black aluminum with soft touch buttons. And when you turn it on, you're greeted by a six inch wide vacuum fluorescent display, which contains all the indicators relevant to the functionality of this thing. And my favorite part, and Laugh at me if you want, but it's the fact that they have a backlight for the little window on your cassette so you can see the progress as it plays. I know it's dumb, but that kind of thing matters to me. The tape door has a damper built in, so it has a nice smooth action. And when you look inside, you can see the three tape heads and the two capstans. The record and playhead are small and connected together, which is necessary to fit inside the tape cartridge. The erase head is tiny and just to the left of the other two. Normally, it would be a lot larger and sit where the second capstan is. So since it can't go there, they made it small and positioned it to index with this smaller opening at the bottom of the tape. Your transport controls are the large buttons along the bottom. Pause, record, play, stop, rewind, and fast forward. To the right of that, you have an output level knob that controls the volume of both the signal going to your amp and that of the headphone jack next to it, which again, Seems trivial, but is so nice to have. The memory stop feature is very straightforward. When you engage it, the deck will simply stop rewinding when the counter gets to zero. Or it'll try, sometimes it overshoots it a little. But that just gives you the ability to make a stopping point anywhere on the tape by resetting the counter to zero at that point on the tape. Playing a tape is easy. Just pop it in the door, close it, and press play. When it gets to the end, it'll automatically stop. It doesn't have an auto reverse function, so you do have to flip the tape over yourself. That's not unreasonable. The rewind time is about normal. 
It takes about a minute 45 to rewind a 30 minute side of a tape. I'm really impressed by the sound quality of this thing. It's very clear. And if you've only ever used cheap cassette players that sound all distorted, like they're underwater or something, you could be forgiven for not realizing you're listening to a tape at all with something like this. Audiophiles might dispute that and they probably have a point, but if you're new to all this, I'm guessing you're more like me and just want to be able to make and listen to tapes with as few headaches as possible. That said, let's talk about recording because that's really where we get to see how convenient this thing is. First though, let's make sure it's hooked up properly. The line out jacks on the deck should be hooked to the playback jacks on your amp and the line in should be hooked to record. If for some reason your amp doesn't have a tape monitor function, you just have to hook it up to the aux port and use it for playback only. Or you can just hook whatever piece of equipment you want to record from directly to the line in jacks if you have to, but it's not ideal. Now let's grab a blank tape and pop it in the machine. The first thing that we're gonna do is advance the tape past the leader. You can do that by playing it for a few seconds or you can use a Bic pen. I usually just play it and reset the counter to zero. Then you engage the auto-tune by just tapping the start button. It'll record its test signal and calibrate the settings, save them to memory, then return to about an inch before the starting point. Make sure the memory stop function is still off or it won't finish that process. If you don't turn on the auto-tuning feature, it will default to the standard record settings for whatever tape type you have. To switch between the calibrated settings and the default ones, you would cycle the memory reference button. Auto-tune settings will show the memory light and the default ones will show the reference light. Let's take a quick look at the other four buttons before we record for the first time. It has Dolby B and C. If you're gonna record and play things back on the same deck, no matter what it is, I would always use the newest Dolby setting. That's C in this case. But if you have something that's been recorded with Dolby B or plan to use a deck that only has Dolby B, you have that as an option as well. The difference isn't really that important, but they just sound kind of funny if recording and playback don't use the same setting. You would engage or disengage Dolby with the left button and select between B and C with the middle one. That goes for playback and recording. The last button is the MPX filter. I've touched on this in other videos, but that's only for recording things off of the radio. MPX refers to stereo multiplexing, and the super basic version of that is that stereo FM signals have extra information encoded in them that isn't audible to us, but can potentially screw with the Dolby signal processing, so the multiplex filter just serves to eliminate that issue. You want it off unless you're recording from FM radio. The final bits before we record are the monitor toggle and the big knob to the right of it. Because this is a three head deck with the playhead a couple of millimeters downstream of the record head, you can hear the actual recording itself as it's being made. The monitor toggle switches the audio output between the signal coming in from the back and the signal coming from the playhead. However, this doesn't change the source of the signal going to the record head. That's always the input at the back, which you can adjust with the large coaxial knob on the far right. To begin the record process, you'll select source and tap record, which will activate the level indicators. Watch the peaks. They've done their best to eliminate the guesswork by giving you a little bar indicator that corresponds to the max peak level of your tape type. All you do is make the input level match the little bar and you're ready in theory. Once that's all set, just tap the play button and you're recording. You may have noticed we didn't have to press pause first this time. The pause function is a little different than the other machines that I've shown in the past. That's partially because whenever the machine is powered on, the motors will be spinning and the circuitry always active. So instead, they've added a mute feature to it. While you're recording, you can either tap the pause button to pause it, or you can press and hold it to mute the recorded signal, leaving a blank portion on the tape for whatever reason you see fit. Keep in mind, it will pause when you let go. So I'm just gonna go through the whole process in real time so you can see how quick and easy recording is with this machine. Not bad, right? It takes all the guesswork out of the process and lets you just focus on making nice sounding mixtapes. Now, there's something I haven't mentioned yet, and that's these glossy wood panels on the sides. These are shown in a lot of their advertisements and literature, but were not standard from what I can tell. A lot of the units I see online don't have these, or maybe they got damaged and removed, I don't know. At any rate, 
I feel like I was very lucky to find a unit that has them in really good shape. I'm gonna open this thing up like I usually do, but I wanna point out two tiny little fixes that I had to do to get the machine back to full health. The left channel was dead. I thought it was just toast, but it worked fine with headphones, which told me maybe it's just something stupid. This is gonna sound so dumb, but I'm shocked how many times I've been able to pinpoint problems by jiggling and tapping on stuff. The RCA output jack had a cracked solder joint, which I found accidentally by just gently pulling on it with a dental pick. So that only took a second to re-solder and now it's fine. The other fix felt a little more like a design flaw. The tape indicator light wouldn't come on when I closed the door. It would flash for a split second with the right setting and then stay off. However, if I pushed on the door gently, it would come back on. So after a bit more poking around, I realized the left side of the cassette carrier has a tiny little feature that pushes against a metal tab that activates the light. Since the door doesn't seem to have an adjustment back and forth, I glued a little foam pad onto the plastic and that took care of the problem. It's janky, I know, but it works. Now, with that out of the way, let's pull this baby apart, shall we? To get the top off, you undo the screws on the sides. These hold the wood panels on as well as the shell, so you want to set the wood pieces aside first where they won't get scratched, and then you can lift the shell off. You kind of have to pull the sides outward and lift up. It doesn't just slide up or back because of a lip on the back of the chassis and on the bottom of the shell. Unlike some of the stuff we've seen, this machine is pretty densely packed. The tape transport is cool. It has a motor to lift the heads into place when you press play, another motor to run the cogs, and an axial flux motor that drives the two capstans, which are synchronized by a belt. Don't worry, I'm gonna spare you any failure to explain the rest of what we're looking at in here. One thing I do wanna mention though, is a little fuse that's next to the transformer. I only point it out because it's kind of hidden if you're looking for it. I'm gonna put the lid back on and flip it around to the back though, because there are two more things that I wanna show you before we go. Right in the center of the rear panel is a rotary selector switch that allows you to select the mains voltage for your region. Since I'm in the US, it's set to 120. It's very important that you don't change that. Putting it on the wrong setting would be Nazgul, hell, Sauron levels of bad. The last thing I wanna show you is this little remote port. That was for the optional RC57 wired remote control, which was sold separately. I've been trying for a few weeks to find one on eBay and have yet to even see one come up. I was kind of hoping I'd be able to grab one before making this video, but it's starting to feel like unobtainium at this point. So that's not gonna happen. But anyway, that's the Denim DR-M44 stereo cassette tape deck from 1984. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Before I go, I wanna remind everyone that the point of this, like any hobby, is enjoyment. We're here because we like old equipment. There's just something fun about it. And whether you have the best equipment on the market or a beat up old tape player that's held together with duct tape and hope, embrace it, enjoy it, and play it with pride. Because at the end of the day, it's all about having fun. So I'll see you guys next time and stay metal, y'all.